today we're discussing CMC's response, the Presidential Initiative on Anti-Racism and the Black Experience in America. We have with us today Associate Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion and our Chief Civil Rights Officer, Narek Gray, uh, who will discuss the newly announced initiative and how we are working this year to develop a long-term structural integrated educational response to racism, inequality, and inequity. CMC is taking on this challenge not to study racism, but to find effective ways to end it. Nare has been with us for six years. Nare, it's amazing how time flies. Uh, before CMC, she was uh, with Southwestern College of Law outside of downtown Los Angeles. Um, so she has a strong legal background and a strong student affairs background, making her probably the perfect person to help lead us through this endeavor. So Nare, if you would like to unmute and start sharing your screen, uh, I will walk some people through uh, the best way to view this presentation and then turn it over to you. So you notice we uh, have a view options button probably at the right of your screen. It could be left, it could be right, it could be at the bottom, but most likely it's at the top. The best way to view this is to click side by side mode, in, the, in, which, in which case you'll see an array on the right side, and then you'll see the presentation much larger on the left side. And then you can see you can see both. You can also manipulate a few different things if you so choose, but hope that's working for you. Nare, thanks for being here. Turn it over to you. Thank you, Evan, for having me. And thank you, everybody, for making time to spend together to talk about the initiative. Um, I appreciate you being with me tonight. It's nice because I made a version of this presentation here and there. So I'm seeing a few familiar faces, which I also appreciate. Um, what we'll do over the next hour is I'll have an opportunity to talk a bit about the initiative and also provide some updates as well. Um, since we're going to be soon sending out just a little update report to the community. So I'll give you a preview of some of what you'll see there. And then I wanted to leave time to engage with like questions, ideas, thoughts, um, where you think energy could be better spent, but I leave it open for a really interactive engagement. So not only do I value your time listening, but I value your suggestions and participation as well. Okay, I'll get started and Evan will uh, man the chats for me and we'll keep going. So first I wanted to talk about just this response and the moment that we're in. And when I think of this moment as a defining moment, I look at a few different areas. One, we can't talk about this space at this moment without thinking about the impacts of COVID and how it's changed and altered the ways that we engage with one another on a daily basis. And when I think about the summer, I think about not just the loss in terms of George Floyd, but I think about the historical monumental moments that came after. The fact that we are able to communicate in this space, um, that it allows an opportunity for people to engage in larger numbers because we are all in our isolated places, but Zoom gives us a form in which to do that. I also think of it as a person who's done civil rights work for decades now, and that a large part of my practice of law with civil rights law. My opportunities as a law professor were in that area. And the commitment to constantly engage around equality and inequality and ways to address it. I also want this initiative to be in part an assessment of the college. I think oftentimes when we think about racism as a collective, we think this is such an ongoing big problem. Where do we fit? And I always think before you step out, and start looking around or looking at others, often look within. And I think this is a time for the college to look within and think about, are there institutional barriers to experiencing the best of what CMC has to offer? Or is everything at the college accessible to every member of the community in similar ways and capacities? I wanted this initiative in part, and when I think about Hiram and I, wanting to make a mark that was different from just another performative statement. Um, thinking about what are our ongoing commitments? Because as we do this work, we want to make sure that people understand this is in alignment with CMC's mission and values. As a community that's committed to developing global leaders, we have to believe that that involves communicating with people who are different from ourselves, educating in areas that are challenging and need critical thinking through a problem solving lens and still being aware of our commitment to open academy, to discourse, to dialogue and incorporating that as we come up with our response at this moment in history. So I, I keep that as the groundwork and framework that we talk about these issues, 
But I also want you to keep in mind as you think about ways that you want to engage your own work is are there reflective comments like commitments that you can make on your own and externally, how will you engage? But the overview and part of this is just to keep you in alignment. There's a component of it that's community learning and engagement, which means we'll talk about ways and some of you participated in the summer reading book club. Others have other faculty members doing other book clubs, um, but some of it is just an engagement about learning. And for many people that I spoke with since the summer, they've been really sharing that piece that there was a part of the world that they knew racism existed, but they didn't know, was this just an individual bad behavior of a person in sporadic incidents? Are there more institutional systemic qualities to inequality that need to be addressed? And so there's a part of this that people are just learning about all the structures and how do they address and engage. The other is student support and opportunities. And I think this is a space that CMC has always prided itself on being able to deliver opportunities that other colleges just can't deliver. But thinking about this in relation to how our current students experience CMC, is there space for us to better educate first-gen students, students of color, women, um, all of the above in connection to making sure that every opportunity here is accessible to everyone in the space? We cannot address systems of inequality without talking about the impact of faculty and what happens in the classroom. And as far as you know, the feedback I've gotten since we put out this initiative, a large part has been some people saying, you know what, all the stuff I'm learning now, I didn't see it through this lens when I was in college. I didn't have access to classes that really talked about diversity, talked about wealth disparities, I just didn't have those and not saying they weren't offered or they weren't part of their curriculum, but they weren't seeking them in that way. And so talking about faculty curricular development and also the composition of our faculty. From year one to now year six, um, we are continuously challenged with the lack of compositional diversity in our faculty. We do better than most, I would say in terms of viewpoint and perspective, but I still think we have a ways to go in that category as well. So overall, making sure that we're able to deliver on the best education possible because we have a variety of voices and experiences in that position to deliver. Next is staff development. And, and this becomes really crucial because I think this is an area that impacts the student experience greatly. Um, that is often in the mix of student-driven programs and faculty-driven programs is a space that sometimes we don't always catch. And so really putting an interest and resources into the development of staff to assessing to make sure CMC is a good working environment for all people to think about and redesign the way that we do recruitment and retention, to think about our community as a place where staff can see themselves being successful long-term. Those are all important things that we're looking internally at our own policies and procedures and also looking externally to make sure we're always getting the most diverse group of talented people possible at CMC. And the last is transparency and accountability. Um, overall, I think when you engage in this type of work, you wanna see progress. And before I even started, there were committees dedicated to progress and we have recommendations from other consultants and things that we've done over the years. And I want the community to have an accessible space to look at what we've done and look at where we're building and look at the recommendations that we've actually addressed and also be critical of the lens of things that maybe we haven't achieved as of yet. And so this was all part of the contemplation of why we thought the initiative at this time was critically important. Important for all of us to think about is a deep dive at every part of the college. And so when we look at the college, alumni are a crucial part. And we also look at it, not just from the time you're admitted, but also even in the recruitment phase, from the time you apply to the time you are graduated and beyond, we look at this as a full part of our community. And so part of it will be connecting to education, but we're also looking at actual experiences that we can create for people to learn. And so when you see things like intergroup dialogue or small group training, um, it's not that we believe training is going to fix the behavior, but it's a space in which to engage in more intimate ways about very challenging conversations. And we wanna facilitate that. We also want to look at the ways in which our websites, our communications, any external way that we talk about CMC, are we highlighting different narratives? Are we ensuring that the full dynamic community 
is represented in those spaces and that we're just not singling out one particular voice to highlight. And so you will already start to see a variety of stories being highlighted, um, further attention being paid to a variety of programs, ways in which we're going to spotlight the different parts of the institution that are moving in the direction and really showcasing how anti-racism work can be implemented, but also how active and engaged our community collectively is in their daily work, in their daily scholarship, in their internships, in all their placements. We have a lot of people who are already doing this, the nature of this work, and lots of people who are adjusting classes or curriculum to address this work. And so you'll see a bit of that in our exchanges as well. All right, quick question for you. You mentioned um, anti-racism, and of course that's, that's our topic, um, but a lot of people don't necessarily know what that means. We know racism, we know racist. What does anti-racism mean? Okay, um, start with the framework, and, and I look at the term anti-racism as something of an evolution of time, of the lens where we are today. So if you look at, initially we were just talking in historic terms of integration, meaning we wanted to end segregation. And part of the experience was trying to move people into an integrated space. And once we move from integration, we work towards tolerance, which this whole concept of, you know, allow me to exist and tolerate without experiencing harm. Then we started to move towards diversity, which is really about representation. Are there voices represented? Is it compositional? Then we work towards inclusion, which is not only am I invited to the party, but am I allowed to dance? Am I actively engaged like everyone else? And I see anti-racism as this space where people are saying, you know what, it's insufficient just to say for myself, I'm not racist, so it's fine. I'm not causing harm, so it's fine. I'm not engaging in things that promote racial privilege one way or another or promote disparities in treatment, so I'm not contributing to the problem. But it's actually asking each one of us collectively to work against the impact of racism in your homes, in your environment, in every environment you're a part of, are you actively engaged in your behavior, intentional commitments to really work against racism in and of itself? So anti-racism isn't of a nature where it says, first, I have to establish that you're racist and then we have to work against it. It is coming at it from a really different lens, which is saying racism in the world does exist. And what are your behavioral commitments each day to end systems of inequality? And so when I talk about anti-racism, I'm really going at that direction of what are the things that we do together as a community to make sure that we are promoting equality, inclusivity, but also that we are looking and saying we are going to actively work to end racism. So that's what I mean by it. Thanks, Evan. Thanks. And please continue. Keep the questions coming as they come in. Um, so overall, when we look at student opportunities, we're looking at the expanded ways we allow for internships, research grants, to really think about ways to let students have access to this work now and to have that guided by people who are already in those fields so that they can leave the college with tools in which to engage in their future um, communities with this lens. There are already talks of diversity in terms of course offerings. I would say we've increased those over time. Um, even this summer, there's a lot of faculty who expanded what they do in their own curriculum to highlight other voices, to make sure that the authors that they have in their courses are diverse, that they're looking at perspectives of different lenses and making sure that they're represented. There's also discussion of actually not adding, because I, I always thought from every student, they're like, you know, CMC has a lot of requirements, but thinking about and looking at the ways in which a requirement in this area really talks about the courses that you're currently taking and thinking about the ways you've engaged with this concept of learning about difference, another culture. And so I know there's still those conversations. There's a lot of work between students, faculty and staff, and I'll touch on it here and I'll probably touch on it later, but the structure of this initiative requires input from all constituencies. So we have steering committees developed for alumni, staff, students and faculty each one of those will have a chair um, that coordinates with the coordinators of the initiative, myself, Matt Bibbins, Diana Graves, Sean Levin, to make sure that we are gathering this not for a one-off experience, not for something that'll last this year and we'll go back to where we were, 
but that each of these initiatives become part of the framework of the institution so that they continue to be part of the way that we just engage as a community. And so you will see increase, increased recruitment efforts. And what I mean by that is that there's going to be more intention to the pipeline in terms of getting more people interested in CMC at an earlier stage, and also more attention paid to them during the process, as well as the assessment of what are we doing right now and are those activities inclusive of each member of our community? Like we think about it, and although we focus in this area, but we're not excluding the experiences of first-gen women, um, not only just students of color, Jewish identified students, students with disabilities. We're looking to see like, are we creating any structures that aren't accessible in the way that they're delivered through the student experiences we already have in terms of woe, research institutes, student hiring. So all of those are part of the way that we assess the college as a collective. Now thinking about faculty. Um, one, it's of course going to be attention to faculty hiring. Has to be and already in play and will continue to be. Um, the other is thinking about research support for faculty so that that will increase the level of retention that we can have with our faculty and education in the classroom about it as it relates to the subject in the context of what they're studying, um, how can they incorporate these principles within the classroom. But keep in mind, we're not being so prescriptive that there's only one way to do this work. We really want to push the envelope in the ways that we think about how do you end racism and the approaches that you take to anti-racism work in the classroom. We want to be able to say, you know, we've engaged this in a very high level and we're not being dogmatic about the way that it's delivered, but more important, intentional about the outcomes we're trying to achieve. Now let's talk about staff for a minute and then I'll definitely make sure I have time to transition to even more questions. Um, we want staff to be part of this process. We wanna provide more opportunities for engagement and education, not just in terms of things they can join with other departments, but also individually in their own professional development, providing resources and support for this to happen. We wanna improve the education and accountability in terms of supervisors. We want this to be part of an evaluation of whether or not you're doing well at the college, um, as well as increasing the compositional diversity of staff, but not just for the purpose of hiring, not just for the purpose of numbers, but for the purpose of ensuring that we are recruiting and retaining people that are going to excel while they're here, employed at CMC. And that those who are here are, never stop learning about ways in which we can better serve the community and better engage with one another. And so staff development, that piece is going to be critical in the delivery of the initiative's efforts. So as I talk about transparency, as I talk through the committees, we already at the college have a faculty diversity committee that's comprised of faculty, staff, and students. And that committee is tasked with what I would call the oversight of the initiative. So once we have the ideas from each part of our community and we prioritize what should be our first steps and how we allocate resources to those, we have to keep a constant measure of accountability and progress. And I think in the past, where some, and I'm not you know, singling out CMC in any, in any way, I think with colleges in general and higher education, the process tends to be you identify a problem, you develop a task force, the task force make recommendations, and then at some point we look back on the recommendation and was like, did that happen or something new happens or the energy of the college shifts in a different direction. We're really trying to make sure that this is not a window that's just open for the moment and then immediately closes. So the burden on that is making sure that we identify measurable outcomes. And we had anticipated being able to launch our first quarterly report by the end of September. It's gonna be coming out very shortly. But along with that, we also will be launching a website. And the website will provide access to members of the community who wanna monitor progress or see where we're going or how the initiative is developing. That's gonna be accessible to the, to the community as a collective. We also want to look at the past and see where we are on other parts of our past recommendations and provide opportunities for people to give insight as to where they think, you know, we're making grounds here, but we need to be a little more proactive. And thinking about it also from the lens of each department. We want to take a look at our policies. We want to see that we're actually making strides 
that will get towards a more inclusive environment the whole way around. And so you'll see that really evidenced. So lastly, I, I talk about what you can do because I get this question a lot and I wanna share openly. Primarily, talents and ideas are always good. Um, I like the way Evan describes time, talent, and treasure, but all are important. And then engaging, just like you did today, engaging what's offered so you can look at the college and also be better educated on where we are, which may be always in alignment with the mission, but the college will continuously evolve. And so really making honest and good assessments of where we are. And on a daily basis, thinking about your own behavioral commitments. Like, are you in a space where you're educating your own family about what anti-racism is, about how we can promote it in your own workspaces, um, about how you share with your own children when these issues and concerns come up? Because I think generationally what we see is that those who are younger have experienced this in a very visual way for most of their lives in a different way than we did as being older because some of it was not so visual all the time. And so I think about it that daily you can contribute to anti-racism in your own behaviors, but more importantly, ways in which that you can continue to partner with us as we develop our own commitments in this space. So I, I think I've addressed most of what people have the general questions about, but I wanna engage now with the conversation and what that means. Um, thanks so much for listening to this part. I wanted to make sure I gave time more for a discussion, but I also give you my email. So please email me and I, and I really appreciated the conversations I've had with individuals even after my presentation. Think about you know, anything that I've said that you have further concerns about or questions about that you wanna engage about, I'm always open. So email me, thoughts, ideas, um, and I look forward to us kind of having this journey together and in, in the way we'll guide and shape the direction of the college. Thanks so thank much, I'm gonna stop share and- Thank you so much, Naray. Um, so a, a number of questions uh, have come in. Um, but, and, and I'm gonna actually jump to Brad's, Bradley's first because I think it's relevant for the topic and then we'll go back to some from earlier. So my apologies for going a bit out of order, everyone. Um, Bradley writes uh, that the title of the initiative includes the black experience in America. Yeah. Can you talk about how this initiative hopes to understand and address that? I think you did a great job about anti-racism and looking at the college and but what about the black experience in America? Great. So, so first I wanna start with the concept of the use of the term experience not to in any way denote a monolithic Black experience. What I want to really talk about is the way and why we selected that experience is that the Black experience in America is a unique experience that still impacts the treatment of Black people today. Um, I think more importantly, when we were looking at CMC collectively, there were some things that I thought were unique to the Black experience even at CMC. When I think about alums and that the composition of our alumni for Black Americans or Black people in general is about 4%, that's incredibly low for a school as rich and talented as this. If I looked at the enrollment of African American students year after year, you know, it, it is a painfully obviously state that says in an entering class of 340, maybe 330, there generally is rarely over 15 Black students. And so a part of this is studying the Black experience in America to see how this impacts the treatment of Black people today, but also as a lens of looking at how we treat everybody collectively. Because I think if you look at the Black experience, you're, it's so long in America been a white and Black issue. And what we're hoping is by looking at this part of the extreme, and we really talk about this experience, it will enable us to actually understand the experience of women, the intersectionality, the experience of Latin people, Asian people, that part of this is all progressively looking at the Black experience just as one narrative as we view the context of why we paired it with anti-racism. The other part is thinking about this is a experience that everyone can be part of in the sense of, I don't think you need to be Black to appreciate the history of America the history of it as an institution, as how we've developed um, all its positive aspects and all those that we have criticism of. And so we also look at the experience of Black Americans as also an expansion on what we look at as the American experience as a collective. So when I, we partnered with that, it's more of, it is one that needs 
us to understand as we understand maybe some of the impact and effects that we see play out now, but even more in, like importantly, as we look and internalize CMC as an experience, it's just another lens. So I hope that answers the question, but I think that gives guidance to why we've paired the two together. Thanks, Dre. I'm gonna go to another question from the chat, then we'll go to Laura who raised her hand in the participant section. Um, okay. CMCers are very much about numbers in many ways. They And so I had a couple questions about, you know, what are diversity numbers on the faculty side, on the staff side, on the student side? What are retention numbers? I mean, there's so many details and this might, might be better and for us to think about the website as we think about benchmarking, um, but what are you able to share in terms of some of the CMC numbers and maybe how either how we compare or where, where you would like to see us? Sure. Um, so yes, part of the website and why I, I appreciate all the work that, that Kate is doing on it is I wanted to have a lens where people can look at that and have access to that information quickly. So if you look at our website, like, yes, we have a fact sheet for every year, but the goal and what we launched with this project to be able to say, you know, in 2015, we had this, in 2020, we had that, in 1985, we had this. Um, overall, what we've seen is a very consistent, I would say the enrollment of African-American percentage-wise at CMC um, generally had been about 5%. I will say in this past entering class, it went to 7%. Um, but that's, I always think that, you know, a community should reflect the nation. And I, I don't have any desire for goals or numerical quotas. I, not only do I, but I really think it doesn't impact the way that you want. I always look at this as I want us to be in the best position at all times to recruit, to recruit the most talented, diverse group of people in every opportunity we have. That means with students in the entering class, that means with staff hires, that means with faculty hires, that means with trustee composition. I want us to be in the space where we're an attractive option for the most talented that are there. What I've realized, and this ties into the numbers, is my concern is that we are admitting a different group than we are yielding. So if I looked at our numbers in terms of who we admit to our entering classes, or even who we've extended offers to in terms of faculty, that's a much more diverse group in terms of Blacks, Latinos, first gen, um, it's women. It's a much more diverse group than who actually shows up in the fall. And so I'm really trying to work that gap in between, which really addresses the concern that others have. And, and I will address it. I anticipate questions in this area. But some people are, are thinking, you know, if we start to recruit in this area, is it going to be inconsistent with, you know, our values or our credentials? And I'm very quick to say, no, actually, we have a shot at even being better. Part of it is I think we're admitting people who have ex exceptional credentials. We're just not yielding them. So few of them are coming. And when we're looking to see why, then we have to look internally about what about us is not attractive to this really talented group. And I think the initiative seeks to address that difficulty. When I talk about faculty, and, and I give the numbers only because it's about the Black experience, I mean, I know those at the top of my head, but I can give others. If I wanted to talk about women, I'll give you an example as a gender, um, a gender assessment in terms of our current faculty. Our current faculty, last I checked, was 68% male, 32% women. Now, interesting, because a part of that can be explained that we were a historically men college, right? So faculty don't leave that often. They tend to stay for long periods of time. So you can see how that could be part of it, but I don't think it explains the entire story because we have been admitting them for the past four years. We can only hold on to that for so long. So overall, when we look at most liberal arts colleges, they're really pushing about 50-50 in terms of their faculty dynamic of men and women. So when I look at it, I have to look at it from two dynamics. One, we have about 10 majors, plus or minus, you could say 11, depending on how you split. And with that, we have to compare that to the population of women who are available, who are getting PhDs in those areas. And even taking all that into account, I still think we could do better. I still think we could attract more. I still think we're making offers that don't always get accepted. If I talk about the number of black faculty, when I came in 2014, I had one black faculty member on a campus with the faculty composition I would say between tenure and tenure track, probably closer to like, I, I would clearly say over 100, I may say closer to 120. Um, if I look at now, uh, I would say, yeah, I'm, I'm up to four. 
And I would say three of those probably came within the last two to three years. So do I see an increase? Yes. Um, do I think it's still a low number? Sure. Am I at a point where I want to be like, we're not great until we get 15? Absolutely not. What I want to focus on, though, is to say I want to look at every applicant pool and make sure we've done all we can. Have we posted in places to let people know this is an opportunity? Are we doing all we can in our recruitment process to be attractive to the largest, most talented group of people? Or are we really reproducing ourselves? Are we only reaching out to people that we know? Because then that means I need you guys to meet more people of color, right? If we're only going to do that, then I need everyone to expand their friendship network. I need us to start thinking about the ways in which we recruit people and have access to the college that will broaden those who are interested in this opportunity. So overall, I, I just want people to think about the stats. But yes, that's a primary source of what will be on the website, like five-year increment comparisons of the composition. Nor, and I just want to be clear about that. It's really going to be limited to the composition that's currently tracked. I will make note of other things that I find add to our diversity in terms of those with military experience, those who have been first gen, those who have come from other countries. Like, there are going to be aspects in that as well. Um, but when people want to see the numbers, I want to be able to supply people with the numbers that we actually track. Thanks, Doreen. I should note that uh, we do have an online fact book uh, that is very public that has a lot of data. Uh, so should you want to dive in a little bit deeper, it's on the um, the uh, uh, the CMC website. So uh, Laura, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. So Evan, thanks for calling on me. And Naray, especially thanks so much for being here, for being a part of the institution and for this great the great work you've done on the initiative and, and being here today. Um, I honestly absolutely thrilled to death that we're taking this on, not just sort of as a part of the course of business, but making it a key institutional priority. I mean, I just, I'm, I'm so proud <laughs> of CMC right now. Um, I did want to dial in a little bit on um, the ways that you um, see the work being done in terms of having the most impact. Um, and I, I'm, impacted myself by a conversation that I had uh, today with a woman who is the director of, it's called the Choral Project, and it's an international group of um, choir and, uh, you know, um, vocal music groups. And we were talking about how in so many ways on so many difficult and powerful issues, the arts can be one of the most Kind of expedient and powerful and transformative ways to share new kinds of understanding, new insights with people. And I know historically we have not been a school focused on the arts. We have, you know, stronger programs than our neighbors. But I just wonder if the committee and, and the working groups have been talking about how we might use the arts, music and art and theater and other um, literature uh, to, um, to just sort of deepen and enrich the the learning process as we all try to understand more and differently. Oh, I appreciate that. I, I think you hit on the area that's probably been most connected, which is literature. I think you're absolutely right in your assessment of the college. And maybe that's, that's how we find ourselves with slightly different challenges than some of our other um, consortium members. There is this kind of thing at CMC sometimes where it's like, yeah, if you want to do that art stuff, you go over there, you go to that other place. What's interesting though, is that we have a lot of students here who are very skilled in those areas. A lot of musicians, a lot of talented singers. Um, if you look at a lot of the acapella groups, there are a lot of our people in all of those too. And so as we started to look more towards pipeline initiatives, we thought those were good, um, those were good areas for us to try to explore more of, to get people connected earlier we were running into a challenge, which is very interesting. Sometimes I think we're better known in Seattle than we are in Claremont, right? Like there's so many of us that are like, we went to high school maybe less than five miles away and didn't know about it until we worked here, right? But then I go to somewhere else like New York and everybody's heard about it, right? So I think we were trying to use areas such as the arts and, and some of especially poetry and writing, the number of people who come in as first year students who have already published something, a poem, working on a book. We were trying to connect those areas as a way to broaden our outreach to who CMC is. We often think about that in the challenge that we have in recruitment. 
a lot of times we don't have areas that are open that actually a lot of communities of color are interested in. We don't have a music program. We don't really do sociology, although I think we have some strong sociologists kind of hiding out in Gov. Um, we have some other areas, but we don't by name have those designs. And so we've mm -hmm. made an opportunity as we value what external leadership looks like to expand it in more of our non-traditional areas for that strength. So I think we'll see more partnerships in that area just to get people better connected with the college. But I will be very open. It would surprise me if we had, you know, the ability to major in something like pottery at CMC anytime soon. Um, but I do think we will be very interested in providing those types of opportunities. And we still support those for our students even currently. So great question. Thanks to you both. Uh, so we had a question coming from uh, Lisa from Denver asking about the student experience, especially as a student group is being formed. How will students be able to express their concerns of either racism or microaggressions uh, when, when they see them at CMC? Um, is there a place they can do it now? Is there something to be developed? Um, how is that, that student interaction piece working? So I'll, I'll share with you what they can do now. And I'll share you some of the ideas that have been pitched as far as expanding those opportunities to share about your experience and to make sure that the issues are addressed. Um, currently, we have, of course, my own office that people can come to, the Office of you know, Diversity, Inclusion, and Civil Rights. We have the Dean of Students that's expansively trained in this area. So those are open opportunities. We train every first year guide, RA, um, Anybody who is going to be in a supervisory or mentorship position, we train them in those spaces to be able to educate others who they report to. So that's one. We also have the ability to report anonymously through CMC Listens. And so those reports that come anonym anonymously are allocated to me in order to investigate. So that's another opportunity. We also get a tremendous amount of support from faculty. So faculty is not at all shy in terms of if they are aware of a situation or their advisee brings a matter to their attention to, to reach out very early and very often in terms of making sure that we can address those concerns. So those are our current methods. Um, what a couple students have brought that, that I'm very much in support of, and I share with this just for feedback as you guys think, they were saying in a very similar way that we currently have our advocate program which really deals towards sexual assault education about you know, sexual assault prevention. Um, they would like to have something in that space in terms of civil rights or um, microaggressions or racial inequalities on campus, that there is a student-led group that actually has that same type of bin in terms of advocacy work and is a resource for people that's more of a peer resource even before they come to administration or faculty. And with the structure of our community being so small, I, I think that aspect already happens informally, but it hasn't been a more formalized peer-to-peer -peer group. And part of it is, you know, when you come to somebody like me, I'm going to address the issue. Sometimes students don't want to actually engage in that type of process, but they do want people to be informed and aware. And so trying to respect the tension of students who want to remain confidential, but students who also want the problem solved, is, is kind of the space that we're trying to engage with right now currently. But yes, there's, a, there's many opportunities in which to make sure those matters are addressed now. And um, we're looking to expand those. In addition, over the summer, I think there's been more of all colleges that people have turned to social media to make these types of reports, not including any names, not even their own. And, and I will let you know, we respond to those as well, to the extent possible as those matters are posted. We look into everyone that impacts CMC and, and we respond and address those um, in addition to those that are brought forward to us. I have another question from the chat, then we'll turn it over to Mark who raised his hand. Uh, Alex okay. Chicago writes uh, that he can foresee a difficulty with getting complete buy-in from some faculty on this initiative. What response have you been getting from the faculty and how have you approached any difficulty with universal buy-in? Okay, hi Alec. Um, yeah, I think that's I, I, I think that really is the key. It's not so much, and, I, and I'll share with it because I want to be very clear. I don't have faculty who are like, no, I don't want more black students. Uh-uh, I don't want more black faculty. Like, I don't have that. I think uniformly, they're like, yeah, that's a really good idea. The concern that may be expressed are ones of philosophical differences about anti-racism, the use of that term, and what is really systemic. So 
it's a perception of where do you approach this issue of inequality and how can the matter or should the matter be addressed in the classroom. So in order to address those concerns expressed by faculty, we did a few things. When, when I share, and I'll definitely share the composition of the faculty steering committee on this initiative, it is very viewpoint diverse. So it is, it is a spectrum of voices on that committee from my most conservative to my most liberal to everything in between. So it is a perspective that takes into account that we all approach addressing this issue differently. The other is we are not mandating one way in which to address anti-racism, which gives people the freedom to not feel that we're being prescriptive or violating their academic classroom experience in order to dictate or guide. But we are sharing the principles of, let's be very clear, it's inequality we're trying to address. So as long as we're in on the end goal, we give you variety in the way that you want to address it. The other is really giving opportunities for people to express the viewpoint and concern. So there's nothing for us, we're not trying to silence any opposition. I hope that people bring their concerns to light so that we can address them. So for the faculty, and that's the nice part of the relationship that I enjoy with them, like very openly, they'll be like, hey, you know, this part I feel fine about, this part I'm not so sure. And for those who say, you know what, I'm not sure about the concept of systemic inequality. I understand that there's bad behavior. I understand individuals may have done wrong things, but to say the entire system is flawed is a concern. And we're able to talk that out. Like we're able to say like, well, here's the thing that makes me think, I want you to think about it from this lens. Like here's my lens of thinking why systemic inequality exists. Here's why actually this is the way the initiative is developed. And once we talk about the content of the initiative itself, we're generally able to come to good solutions and good discussion about it. And I think overall, in terms of responses, I've probably got more critical responses about um, things that are not in the initiative that people attach to it on their own. Like when I go, like I totally understand your concern, it's just not part of the initiative, right? Like I get what you're saying, that's an interesting political concern, it's just not what we're trying to do here. And when I can anchor people back into the actual language of the initiative, they tend not to have the same concern. I think people are further concerned with externally, like the national climate discussion that is definitely tense at this moment, that they're concerned of how that will guide the implementation of this process. And to the extent that I can continue to um, engage with them about how truly consistent this is with the mission and values of not only the college, but in many times the work they're already doing, it tends to work out. And so overall, I, I, I don't think a healthy dose of criticism is bad. Um, I, I do think overall, I, I think that's a positive thing. And no, I don't expect everyone to be like a cheerleader for every part of it, but I do expect people to respect, you know, the ideals of where the college is, is trying to make an impact. Thank you. Mark, if you'd like to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question, please do so. Thank you. Um, with your important work uh, to promote anti-racism, how do you avoid um, reverse discrimination um, where um, white males are excluded or denied admission or selection into various programs to give underrepresented groups a better opportunity where there might not have been one before um, when the selection process was um, a meritocracy? And how do you deal with the um, backlash um, of reverse discrimination uh, from a legal and an ethical uh, perspective? I know that there are other universities who are um, fighting um, some of this uh, in the courts. And has there been any adverse uh, reaction from students, faculty, and alumni? Thank Great. you. Thank you, Mark. Um, I wanna address each piece of it because I think each piece of your question is important. And so I'll start with the meritocracy piece. So I, I think presumed in, in that type of concern of potential reverse discrimination or this inference that it will now not be tied to meritocracy has a few presumptions in it that I, I just wanna address for, for people to consider. If you're of that belief, then you're believing that based on merit was the way we have done admissions the whole time. And for many people, they believe merit ties to two things, grades and test scores. 
what I would share in that vein is that actually, even prior to this, there's been a variety of programs at all colleges. And so when you think about your challenge to a particular program, I want you to think about um, concepts of legacy that have always been at colleges. And if you're a predominantly historically white institution, then that has provided the benefit for years that people don't really say is inconsistent with meritocracy, but just assume it's part of the college. I would even look at some forms of athletics that we give some type of consideration to. And if you're thinking of sports that have been hysteric, like just historically not really inclusive of people of color, then the benefit that you give to athletes who are in these sports also has an implication maybe why school may be less or more diverse. So when we talk about merit, I want people to think about the fact that one, um, we have to first agree on like what the merit is that we're seeking. The second part, which I think is more important is, is we haven't developed those programs. Like we haven't developed a program here that's exclusive of males, exclusive of white people. Um, and as I anchor in before, we've actually been admitting people based on the system we have. We just haven't been attracting them. Like, so we've already on our own standards that we had before have found them worthy, which is why we admitted or made an offer or tried to hire. We just haven't been attractive to them. And so overall, I think any program that attracts more talented people is a good one and doesn't work to the exclusion of, of anyone. Lastly, I, I often think about this because I'm so happy someone was kind of brave enough to bring it up. Um, people have a presumption sometimes that if you develop or you focus your energy in a way that is saying, I'd like a more diverse pool or different people, that it works to the exclusion. Like if it's not you, then it's me. And I really want people to think about the fact of at any given time, we're all trying to do the same thing, which is saying we believe CMC has an amazing mission and provides an amazing opportunity to the most, what we think is the most talented. And that's never going to change. So I never want people to embrace that opportunities to expose this amazing experience to more people is therefore going to allow us to do something inconsistent with the goal of getting the most talented people in this space. We're always gonna be committed to that. And I think even as I talk to faculty or staff or students and they're concerned, let's not even go to anti-racism, but just on diversity, and they're concerned like, is there gonna be a racial challenge? Well, the racial challenge would be if we said, no, we're never admitting white people. I can assure you that hasn't happened, nor will it ever. That's not the space or even the desire. I think the desire though, is to make sure that we're giving an actual opportunity for everyone that is in many ways, giving people an experience that you hope they will actually benefit from. So we're looking at what value does that person add to the college? And also what are they gonna benefit from being in this particular space? And will this be a good opportunity for both of us? Like I, I think every time we admit someone or hire someone, we're looking for them to contribute in this environment. So we're looking for what are you gonna contribute that we may not already have represented? Like what are you gonna add that we don't currently have? And in doing so, I don't think it works to the detriment of anyone, um, but it allows a broader space in which people can engage. So, so I hope, and, and I'm always happy to engage, and I think that's the best part. Is there a backlash? Uh, not that's been presented. I think it's been overwhelmingly positive, like just positively received. But for those who have concerns, I want people to escalate the concern because I think once I hear their concern, I'm better able to address like what you've seen done poorly in other places is not what we're trying to do. What you've seen in other spaces is actually not what we're trying to achieve. And then invite them to be part of the process to ensure that concern doesn't materialize in the work that we're doing. Um, so I hope that addresses the question. I've really had more positive for those who have had some concern and it has been a concern. Um, then we talk through how that would be managed, like how that actually is is not going to be in alignment with what we're trying to do overall. Like it wouldn't be good for the college either way. And people tend to respect that. Um, but I, Mark, I can't appreciate you enough. Thanks, thanks Mark for asking your question. Um, <clears throat> let me go one in the chat, then we'll go to JD in it with his hand raised. And that might be all the time we have. 
Ken wants Hi. to, Ken from Dallas wants to talk about general education requirements. Um, something that a few other people uh, brought up as well. Uh, there is a push by some, of course, to have a mandated GE uh, that deals with uh, racial justice or racism or anti-racism. Uh, there's also conversation, you know, people that don't want that. CMC has a lot of GE requirements, more so than most places. Although I remind people we are a liberal arts college, you should be uh, educated very, uh, very liberally in terms of topics. Um, are there now more culturally focused classes to address some of these issues? Or will there be? What, how, what are your thoughts on general education requirements or some other academic requirement to address this area? Great question. I think I get asked for that more than anything. And um, I wanna address it two ways. One, yes, I do think that there are more classes that either directly address this as the content of the class or have made this a component of the class to just add more perspectives and voices and to tackle these issues substantively within the framework of what they're teaching. So yes, I think that's happened. There's also been more um, curricular innovation grants and support from the Nina faculty's office to allow people room to actually educate themselves well so they can competently do that type of work. Cause you can't wake up tomorrow and decide, yeah, I'm gonna teach anti-racism. Like it doesn't work like that. You actually have to be talented and, and skilled and understand um, the theories behind it in order to deliver it well. So that's there. The second part, and I, I think you're right, is an interesting way. And I wanna share a concept that's being kind of discussed now amongst curriculum that eventually we'll get to full faculty. It's not to add an additional requirement, but it's to say of the courses that you take before you graduate, at least one has to cover this. So sometimes things are a requirement, like you must take a math class. Other things are what we call an overlay, which means of what you're taking substantively, like in your classroom experience, it has to cover X. The benefit of the second way is that you can have a class count for two things. You can meet a requirement and still satisfy that this basis of knowledge and inclusion and equity and um, you know inequality is also covered without adding an additional requirement. And I think that's the direction that's being put forward now that's kind of gaining traction among students and faculty, because I think both have the same concern of thinking about how not to add to an already really condensed workload with very little room for electives, but how to make sure that that knowledge and that discussion and that understanding is addressed before you graduate. So I think that's pretty much where the discussion is as of this moment, but I'll keep you posted because um, as soon as it comes through, I would update it and let you know. Great. Uh... We have just a couple minutes left. JD, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, go ahead. Yeah, it's not really a question. It's um, just a kind of a statement. Um, first, I'm excited that this work is being done. I'm from the class of 76. And so I'm also disappointed that after 40 something years, pretty much CMC is at the same place that it was when I graduated. So that's really frustrating for me. I'm working in a local school district here in Bremerton, Washington, where I'm a teacher on special assignment equity. I've been doing this work my entire career. So I just wanted to offer a caution because there was a comment in the chat about getting buy-in from some of the staff and everything. And my, my perspective is you don't need to worry about buy-in from anybody. If this is a presidential initiative for the, for the school, the plan should be this is how we're rolling. We're moving forward. And if you're down with this, but you don't feel comfortable, we can provide you support. We can provide you help to get on board. But if you're not down with this, you can find your happiness elsewhere. It's not about trying to change people to the point where they're so against it, you're fighting them. What I found in this work is that if you spend too much time on the people who just are not gonna buy in, the people who wanna move forward are gonna get frustrated because they're gonna be going like, why are we wasting time on these guys? We got people that are on fire. Let's keep them going and move forward. So however you guys decide to roll with this work, you've got to make sure that the choir is fired up and you've got to make sure that those people that need support get it so that they can help move forward also. My biggest fear in the work that I'm doing is I'm near the end of my career in terms of working there. I'm 66 years old. I know I don't look like it because I'm 
trying to take care of myself, but I'm 66. And my fear is that when I retire, that everything's going to fall apart. So all my efforts are is to build that structure and build other people and provide them the support. So we've built, my wife and I built equity teams in every building in our district and every department, and we've trained them and we support them. And people that just want to know, we've done the book studies and all the things that you talked about. That's why I'm saying I'm kind of frustrated that that's CMC is just still there. So, you know, keep, keep it going. I'm, I'm willing to help in any way that I can, but I'm not a committee guy. I'm about the work. So I, I don't want to be on a committee, but if there's things that you need help with in terms of training or anything, I'm, I'm there because I've been doing it for my entire career and I'm ready to go. And real quick, the Ringmasters comic book that I'm writing, I have a Facebook page and a website. So check out the Ringmasters comic on Facebook and, and talk to me, man. Send me an email. I'll put my email in the chat so people can contact me, man. CMC all the way, man. Cool. Oh, Mike Sutton, wherever you are, man. I don't see you on my screen. Shout out to you, man. Good to see you. There you are. I got you, man. <laughs> Thank you, JD. We were both RAs, man. I love it. Thank you. Appreciate your comment. And I'm not surprised you're not a committee guy. It's all good. I'll reach out. Thank you so much. Thanks, JD, for your comments. We will we will absolutely reach out. Uh, Nare, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, I hope you're willing to come back and and maybe give us an update in February or or, or March. Yeah. We can we can talk about that. Uh, everyone, uh, look out for the website that'll be going live. Hopefully within the next month or so. In the next report that we'll be sending. Um, but I thank all of you for your uh, attention and your engagement. Feel free to email myself, of course, Nare and Gray at cmc.edu with any thoughts and questions. And tell your friends too. Remember this session um, is for everyone. And with people who have concerns, who people aren't sure with where we're going, um, this will be up hopefully early next week uh, on our virtual page. Uh, so please do direct people um, that way. So, all right, thank you all very much. Nare, thanks again. Our next thank session you. will be Monday at four o'clock Pacific time where we talk with the Office of Admission about coronavirus uh, in the world of CMC admission, what that means this year, and how alumni and parents can help us move us forward, including on some topics that were actually touched on today. So hope to see many of you on Monday at 4 p.m. Feel free to unmute, say goodbye, say thank you. Uh, goodbye, everyone. Have a great night.